my fermentation, my, my presentation uh, will focus on uh, fermentations and its role in the um, um, in the valorization of byproducts from the fruit and vegetable uh, uh, industry. But first, but first, uh, I want to lay out some basic concepts about fermentation technology. And only after that, I will show you two examples of uh, products that, that can be produced uh, through submerged fermentation, as Bruno already talked to, to you about. Are you listening well? Si. Uh, okay. Okay, so um, microorganisms uh, pr uh, produce, need to produce fats and lipids, polysaccharides, uh, nucleic acids and proteins and so on, uh, so uh, they can grow and uh, divide. So uh, all these uh, molecules are uh, made of uh, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, and into a lesser extent of hydrogen and uh, other elements such as phosphorus, sulfur, and potassium. And so if we need to grow these cultures, these microorganisms, we need to supply all these elements to... Uh, to the cells, uh, either in the form of a growth medium or through the addition of um, air, uh, CO2, uh, sugars, uh, and so on. Okay, so if, assuming that we are supplying all these nutrients that the cell needs to grow and all the needs for the cell are met, like pH and temperature, then we would observe an exponential Sorry about that. Uh, we would observe uh, an exponential growth of cells uh, if no restrictions to the growth were observed. But in fact, what, what we normally get is this kind of growth profile where uh, we can identify a lag phase followed by a exponential growth stage, a stationary stage, and death stage. In this uh, initial lag phase, uh, the cells are still adapting to the, to the medium. And so uh, it, it takes a little time for the cell to produce all the, the enzy enzymes needed to uh, start to grow and divide. When the cells are finally adapted to the medium, then we observe this exponential growth where a constant specific growth rate of cells is observed. And at this point, no restrictions in growth uh, uh, happen, and it is a moment where uh, the populations of cells is more homogeneous. However, when nutrients become scarce, for example, or uh, if the cell is producing some inhibiting compounds, then the growth starts to slow down, and we reach the stationary stage where uh, it, it, we can observe an equi equi equilibrium between cells dividing and cells dying, or we can even uh, have cells still maintaining its viability, uh, but they are not dividing at uh, 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 such active state. And after that, then we observe a death stage where obviously here, um, this means that more cells are dying than the ones maintaining viability. So if you want to extend this uh, exponential stage, we need to supply to the cell, to the culture, um, a set of uh, conditions. This, and, uh, and so um, we need to know what is the best temperature for the cell to grow, the best pH, uh, composition of medium, concentration of nutrients, uh, and also very important, the right dissolved uh, concentration um, uh, of uh, oxygen. In an industrial uh, setup, uh, all these parameters are strictly, st strictly uh, monitored and controlled, um, and depending on the goal of the process, we may need to maintain all these parameters constant or we may need to vary them over time. But first, we need to know what are these parameters. We need to find out what are the best parameters. And we start 
these studies in a small scale um, performed in either uh, uh, deep well plates with a capacity of one to two milliliters culture and also in shake flasks uh, with capacity that goes up to one liters, one liter. And uh, in this uh, small scale, we can uh, know, we can find out what are these basic parameters such as uh, temperature, uh, composition of medium, um, pH also, um, determine an in, uh, initial uh, values for growth rates and yields of the process. This uh, small scale has uh, two basic um, disadvantage, disadvantages is that are the incapacity to control the concentration of dissolved oxygen and, uh, and to control the pH of the culture. After these initial uh, studies in a small scale, we uh, can um, we um, start to um, to grow the cells and to, to transfer the this first knowledge into uh, bioreactors, fully controlled bioreactors that go up to 10 liter scale, and uh, in these bioreactors it's possible to control. Uh, pH, concentration of dissolved oxygen, foam formation, um, stirring feed, uh, stirring speed, sorry, um, and the fact that we can monitor and control all these, par all these parameters will allow us to uh, build a more complete picture about the process dynamics and to, uh, to develop more complex uh, strategies of fermentation. After that, uh, we transfer again the technology, technology to a pilot scale fermentation that goes up to 1,000 liters. And at this point, we need to have uh, the same kind of uh, geometry. This is the, the fermenter that we have in our facilities uh, with a capacity of 250 liters that Bruno already shown you uh, before. Uh, and at this point, we need to have the same geometry that we will find in an industrial facility. And uh, also, at this point, it's completely essential to have all the utilities that uh, will also be present at uh, an industrial facility, like air, uh, com uh, compressed air, uh, and uh, steam generator gener generators, chillers, um, and uh, uh, a set of, of uh, sensors that will be uh, uh, mounted into the, the fermenter. Okay, the fermentations can be operated in batch, fed batch, and continuous mode, being the fed batch uh, mode the more uh, versatile and the one that uh, is normally used to build up a uh, high concentration of biomass. Uh, and in this mode of operation, the, the vol normally we start with um, a, a growth medium with low concentration of carbon source, and then after a period of, of batch, uh, we start to feed the culture with a concentrated solution of a given carbon source like glucose, for example. And this, uh, fed, uh, th this feed mode uh, can, uh, and this feed solution, sorry, uh, can be fed, could be fed continuously to the reactor or, or could be uh, varied over time. Um, okay. The most common, uh, the most common bio controlled bioreactor uh, is the stirred tank reactor. It's a uh, a cylindrical vessel uh, with a, a working height to diameter uh, normally of two to four uh, in which uh, an impeller and uh, baffles uh, normally exist to help mixing all the components and uh, have a, an important role in dispersing the air bubbles uh, that are supplied uh, to the fermenter through an air sparger. Okay, so 
when we increase the volume of the fermentation ve vessels, we start to have some problems in the mixing of uh, the components, either the, the medium or uh, the oxygen supplied to the, to the, the culture. And, and so we need to uh, have great care when we are uh, increasing the, the size of the fermenter uh, because we cannot extrapolate the, the data that we obtain uh, at a smaller scale into a higher scale simply because when, high, uh, when um, we increase the size of the vessel, we start to get, for example, uh, gradients of uh, dissolved oxygen. And what this means is that when cells are circulating in the reactor, they are subjected to different concentrations of oxygen. And this could, um, could uh, mean that the, the culture uh, will uh, divert its metabolism into unwanted products or even uh, produce some inhibiting compounds like ethanol, for example, in a Saccharomyces fermentation. Um, and this leads to a decrease in the process yield, of course, because cells are not doing what they're supposed to do at all times. The same happens uh, let, let me just tell you that this is particularly important in a, in a aerobic fermentation where concentrations of uh, dissolved uh, uh, oxygen are really very important. And the same happens in a fed batch fermentation. Uh, when we are adding a very concentrated solution uh, into the culture, in the point where uh, the, the, the solution drops, the cells in their vicinity are subjected to very high concentrations of uh, carbon source. And uh, as, as um, we observed in, in, when compared to concentration of uh, d uh, dissolved oxygen, the cells can divert its metabolism into, again, unwanted products or even start, uh, stop growing because concentration of uh, the carbon source is too high. And so we need to uh, have great care when designing a, a, ferment, a fermenta, fermenter vessel um, because of these constraints in the process. Also, I will not um, go into great detail, but uh, also e-transfer is a major uh, concern when um, increasing uh, when increasing the. Um, the, the size of the vessel and the, the, the fermentations itself. Um, and I, I just want you to bear in mind that because due to the cell activity, uh, most probably you will have to continuously cool the fermenter in order to maintain the, the set point temperature. Finally, one last issue uh, that I want to to address is the uh, generation of the inoculum. In a very large fermentation, uh, we need, uh, we need um, an inoculum very strong, very active. Uh, and you, we, ha we have to know that normally the uh, amount of inoculum rep represents 5 to 10 percent of the initial fermentation medium. So. In a large fermentation, we need to, we need to have a series of uh, inoculations uh, with increasing uh, sizes of, or volumes so that when the inoculum reaches the biggest fermenter, it's a really strong culture, uh, active, so that the permanent time in the reactor, in the bigger reactor, is minimized. Because as you may imagine, the cost of operating this large vessel is really high when compared to those small, smaller ones. Okay, so um, after this brief um, presentation about some basic concepts, I uh, just want you to show you some examples of products that can be obtained by submerged fermentation. Bruno already talked to you a little bit about the PHAs, 
which are uh, um, polyesters, and that are accumulated in a cell as uh, a response to a, a stress imposed to a cell, and, and so the microorganism accumulates the, uh, the PHA uh, as a reserve stock energy of carbon, okay? Depending on the elements uh, of the, the monomers, you can get different uh, polyhydroxyalkanoids, um, and these different uh, polyhydroxyalkanoids will then have different characteristics, and so we can obtain rigid thermoplastics, thermoplastic elastomers, as well as grades of waxes, adhesives, and binders. Normally, in a process of PHA production, we first have a stage um, of uh, bio biomass buildup, and then the accumulation of PHA is triggered by limiting one uh, nutrient in the presence of, carbon, uh, of an excess carbon source, normally uh, limiting nitrogen or uh, phosphate in aluminium. Okay. Here, uh, okay. We've, at Biotrend, we've successfully uh, scaled up uh, a process of production of PHB in, in, in the scope of another uh, European project where um, wheat straw uh, lignocellulosic hydrolysate was used as, as feedstock. And as you can see here, we were able to maintain productivity in the bi biggest scale for a, a very long period of about 20 hours, which is really, really good in a large fermentation vessel. Another example is the production of succinic acid. Uh, as already been mentioned, is a, a platform chemical, uh, and, uh, and so this means that this, uh, this succinic acid is uh, an ingredient in several industries, such as food industry, uh, chemical industry, and pharmaceutical industry. Uh, many research uh, has already been done uh, using uh, both bacteria and yeast. Uh, processes using bacteria uh, will, um, um, where the conditions of fermentation are uh, with a, a pH higher than the, the dissociation um, um, constant of the acid, will um, uh, so um, will mean that in the end of the process we will get a, the salt of uh, uh, we will get a salt instead of the free acid, and so we, we will need to add an additional step to transform the the salt into the free acid. And as you can imagine, this increases the cost of the process. Um, on the other end, when using his that can grow at low pH, we will get in the end of the process mainly the free acid. And this is a great advantage when compared to the process using bacteria. Uh, in the scope of the Transbryo project, we are working with non-genetically mo modified microorganisms uh, that naturally accumulate some succinic acid. And at Biotrend, we've screened more than 1,000 Saccharomyces uh, yeast strains that were provided by University of Minho. And um, when, designing, um, when designing a process for production of succinic acid, we really need to know well the metabolism of the, the cell. Uh, and only knowing that we can optimize uh, a process of production. And so, when we look at this, this is the three carboxylic acid, which is the uh, major, a uh, major uh, carbon pathway. We see that the succinic acid is an intermediary uh, product or a, uh, product of uh, the metabolism, and this means that normally, when the cycle is working properly, 
uh, this, the succinic acid will not accumulate in the cell. It will then be converted into fumarate and so on. And so um, we need to find a way to optimize this accumulation in, in the cell. One way to do that uh, is by limiting the concentration of the carbon source that we supply to the cell. In this way, we can um, minimize this diversion of the metabolism into ethanol and biomass production <coughs> and try to obtain more uh, of the succinic acid. Of course, this is not really uh, easy to do and most probably we will have to, to do some genetic engineering uh, so that we can stop or at least slow down the conversion of the, fumar the, the succinic acid. Nonetheless, we've tried to uh, design uh, a process where we could optimize the produ production of succinic acid and here you can see 10 isolates that were tested at Biotrend compared to a reference strain, a natural producing uh, natural uh, strain of, uh, of yeast, and three strains that were genetically manipulated into, uh, in order to optimize the, the production of succinic acid. And what you can see is that we managed to get a good uh, concentration of succinic acid when compared to those references. And we even managed to get a high, uh, higher concentration than the genetically manipulated strains that were optimized into, uh, to produce more succinic acid. And we managed to do that with a naturally producing strain. And although these concentrations are still quite below the limit where uh, an industrial process would be feasible, uh, we, get, we have this strain at least, that it's a promising strain uh, to subject to some genetic manipulation and try to optimize the, the production. This is at some kind of good results, I guess. Perdona, Ana, five minutes. Yeah. Um, so just to f finish, in the scope of the, the project, of course, we want to uh, valorize some byproducts of the fruit and vegetable transformation industry. And we've tested potato pulp hydrolysates, sweet corn hydrolysates, and pressed banana pulp juice supplied by several of the partner partners of the project. Um, and we managed to get some uh, significant results with the potato pulp hydrolysis. And that's it. Thank you very much.